we're going to be talking about a post exploitation tool, but uh, we just have an extra little add on of this O-Day. So when uh, Jen and Magius and I were working on Eternal Blue, uh, we discovered that uh, part of the pool grooming process was allocating uh, memory uh, in a contiguous way. And by abusing those memory allocations, we were able to come up with an attack that we're calling SMB Loris. It's similar to uh, the slow Loris attack that is for HTTP servers. So with that, a single machine is able to open uh, many connections. Hold on, I just wanted to show the flags here. So the first uh, four bytes of a connection are this uh, NetBio session setup header, and it has a 17-bit length field. So what Windows is going to do is it's going to see that length field and it's automatically going to allocate a buffer uh, for whatever length you say, for whatever length you say, and uh, preemptively allocate that much memory on the non-paged pool, which is memory that cannot be uh, swapped out. It's physical RAM that has to be reserved. So 2 to the 17 gives you 128 kibibytes, and if you uh, send many connections that do that, uh, from a single IP you can get to 8 gigabytes, which is like 8.5 gigabytes. So we're going to demo the attack now. And all we're doing is opening a lot of connections and sending uh, this packet with a full length. And as you're seeing now, the uh, non-paged pool is filling up. It's actually down here. Right now we're at five, five and a half gigs. And eventually this ping is going to die because there is not enough uh, RAM. And you'll also notice that the CPU has spiked to 100 because now the operating system is searching through memory looking for a free spot. And now we actually have freezed uh, the computer. So like Slowloris, if we stop this attack, uh, the computer will restore. Unless you sustain the attack, eventually you will get a hard freeze which is worse than a blue screen because then you need physical access to uh, restart that machine. Uh, you can't just RDP in. Um, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and I just want to mention that we did report that to uh, Microsoft Security about 60 days ago. Uh, they said they weren't going to fix it right away. So we had to uh, go to full disclosure. We already told uh, our DDoS partners and stuff like that. So, <laughs> and it works on IPv4 and IPv6. Um, so here's just some of the artifacts that we have that happen. Uh, the first one is just like a hard freeze, um, and then you can crash programs. And then right here is Microsoft's response. Uh, this is fine. <laughs> All right. So on to the main topic of the day. Uh, we're going to talk about the current open source malware options for red teams. So these are things that uh, you can use on your pen tests to, you know, own a network. And then we're going to release a new tool uh, called Coatix C3. It's an advanced JScript VB script rat. Uh, it's based on a lot of work by others, um, Sub T, Enigma OX3, uh, Tiranado. Um, they've been doing a lot of work on research, a lot of research on JScript uh, past year or two. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the hell we went through uh, with Windows scripting host quirks. And then at the end, we're going to have a demo of the tool. So this is uh, a list of the people who helped uh, work on this tool. Uh, I'm zero sum. That's LF not. We got Jenna Magius in the audience, and the Naders is watching the live stream. Um, so we're the red team at RISSense. It's a spinoff of New Mexico Tech, uh, led by Dr. Srinivas Mukamala. He lets us have time to do some research on side projects, so we've done uh, Extra Bacon and Eternal Blue. We ported both those exploits to Metasploit. Uh, we're kind of the first to uh, look at those exploits. Uh, just a couple quick notes before we get started. So if you use this tool for illegal activities, we're not responsible. Uh, we're releasing this for pen testers. There's no like ransomware in it or anything. Uh, like I said, there's a ton of overlapping research uh, from Sub T and Egmo, X3 Tiranado. Um, but we're trying to consolidate all those research techniques into a single tool, and we've also advanced the state of art a little bit. Um, so this is just a prototype. There are going to be bugs in it. Uh, so submit fixes, not tixes. <laughs> and uh, just to be very clear, this is a post-exploitation tool, so this won't be like Metasploit where you get access to a box. This assumes you already have access, and you want to do something better with that shell. You want to pivot. Uh, dump passwords and stuff like that. So the current state of Windows post-exploitation, you have, you know, Meterpreter, Cobalt Strike, PowerShell Empire, 
or you can roll your own. Those are basically your options right now for uh, very, and they're all very nice tools, but we're going to talk about some of the, the downsides of those tools and where this kind of fills a very niche gap. Uh, you're not going to use this tool a lot, but it will fill a, a very niche gap. Um, so the downsides of PE malware, this is stuff like Cobalt Strike and Meterpreter. Um, so they're both amazing software, uh, but most of the times in a post exploitation scenario, you're going to be dropping a binary on disk, and that's what AV loves to eat. And you're going to you're going to have to evade that payload with either Veil Evasion or Shelter or some type of cryptor or packer. Um, so that's one downside. And one of the main exploits we have eaten a lot is uh, PS Exec, which is probably the most common one you use on a pen test. Um, so the downsides of PowerShell again, Empire is amazing software. Officially, it requires PowerShell, obviously, which is Server 2008 Service Pack 2. You can install it on earlier versions, but officially, that's what Microsoft supports. And PowerShell Empire also uses some features that are in modern.net. So I've actually had uh, the case where I compromised a box and had PowerShell on it, tried uh, doing an Empire stager, and it failed uh, with an error. Another very bad downside of PowerShell is that it is a first class citizen in the logs on Windows. So that's, that's one thing you need to realize when you're using PowerShell is you are uh, filling up the logs. So we've, fill, we've made a tool made out of uh, JScript and VBScript. Um, it works on Windows 2000, Service Pack 0, possibly earlier. Uh, the main benefit of that is that the Windows script host, unlike PowerShell, is baked directly into the Windows core unlike PowerShell, which was like bolted on later. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to limit. And we found some creative use of uh, the default EXEs that are in the system folder. And we also found some ways to execute completely in memory so there's no dropping to disk. And that's the main benefit of PowerShell. Take some water. So the downsides are that there is no access to the Windows API. Uh, the only thing you get is com objects, which I'll talk about in a second. There's also no real threading, so when you have an agent running, you might want to run multiple jobs at the same time and have them report back. Uh, there's no threading in JScript. It's also missing a lot of uh, standard functions like base64. You can use certutil and some other utilities that are default installed, but they're not on all versions of Windows. And then what's really bad is uh, all the strings are UCS2 wide Unicode. So when you insert uh, struct or shell code in memory, it's going to fill it with null bytes or even just totally uh, clobber all of your strings and you're not going to have the same shell code that you put in that you thought you had. So COM was kind of this uh, big idea from Microsoft that you could write uh, a class in one uh, language and then instantiate an object in another language. So what they did was uh, write a lot of COM objects in C and then now you can use them in JScript and other uh, scripting languages. Um, so it's language neutral, object oriented. It has a very uh, spelled out binary interface and it's distributed so you can actually instantiate objects on another server and then use them on your local host uh, which actually leads to a lot of pivot opportunities. Um, it's an arguable precursor to .NET. It has slightly different goals than .NET did and .NET has a lot of tools that help you interact with COM. And it's also found everywhere in Windows. It's in, uh, it's its own secure, uh, its own registry hive. It's uh, the HC, or HK uh, current classes, or classes. So this is uh, an example of instantiating a an, uh, COM object in JScript. So what we've done here is we've instantiated this object called HTML file. And like I said, we don't get access to Windows API, but we get access to all the interfaces that this uh, com object exposes. And from that, we're actually able to scrape the clipboard by uh, going to the parent window and getting the text. So we originally started this project back in October using VBScript. VBScript and JScript are basically the same thing at the end of the day. They just have slightly different syntax and uh, a couple other things. Uh, one thing that's really bad is that uh, it has, VBScript has an insane error handling thing where you have to do on error, resume next at every function scope, and then for every uh, instruction that you run, you have to check if there's an error condition. So there's no like uh, try catch blocks that you get 
in uh, JScript. The other thing that we ran into was Schlemel the painter problem. So this is a problem with string indexing. Normally for string indexing, you want O of one lookups. So you want to look at the hundredth element in the string. That's O of one. Uh, with JScript, it counts from the beginning of the, or with VBScript, it counts from the beginning of the string. Uh, so you actually get O of n factorial to traverse the entire string instead of O of n. Uh, so Jen Magias had a, he solved the uh, uh, hardest problem in computer science when uh, we just moved the bucket with us. So every thousand iterations, we moved the start of the string pointer up. Um, while working on this tool, we uh, researched uh, GNU Readline, which is an uh, interactive shell for um, Linux and Unix systems. So in Metasploit, what happens is uh, as shells start to rein in, your input is getting overwritten by uh, all those shells raining in. So we were able to uh, redraw every time a shell came in and not mess up your input. And that's just a, that picture is just an example of uh, kind of the bad input. Uh, we committed it in PR 7570 to Metasploit. Uh, they've actually commented it out. They have to support Windows and some other systems. So uh, it wasn't, there was a couple bugs there, but we're only supporting Linux. So I'll talk about some of the uh, terminology before I talk about how we architected this. So a zombie is a hook target. It's basically like um, a session in Meterpreter or uh, an agent in PowerShell Empire. Uh, Stager is a web server that we use to have the C2, C3 server. And then an implant uh, just starts one or more jobs on a zombie. And then a job, we figured out a way to fork and so you can have uh, simultaneous jobs running and then they report back to the server. So this is done by a plugin class. There's two types of major plugins or uh, stagers which spawn web servers and implants which start jobs. Uh, they all have a load method which has uh, variables. So these are like things that you set in interpreter kind of. Uh, all we do is a simple string replace for tilde and the variable name uh, inside of JS files. And then they also have a run method. Uh, which, like I said, starts an HTTP server or starts a job. Uh, uh, the job class is what you instantiate uh, from implants, and they have a report handler, so when the job reports back to you, you're able to handle that. And then we also implemented a standard lib.js file, which uh, kind of abstracts a lot of that comm stuff for you, so you can run commands, upload, download files, and uh, perform those HTTP communications. Uh, we have all the standard impact categories you would expect. You can pivot, so move from machine to machine. Persistence, so you can, uh, if a machine reboots, it'll still call home. Uh, managing utils are kind of like, they'll, they'll let you enable RDP or run commands, download, upload files. Elevate is a whole class of UAC bypasses, so that's the run as administrator box on Windows. Um, gather will scrape credentials out of, uh, from the hives, like NTLM hashes. We actually wrote a TCP scanner, which I'll get into in a little bit. We have a fun category like PowerShell Empire does. Uh, they play ACDC's Thunderstruck. They blast the volume to play that. We do that, but we do uh, the Cranberry Zombie song. <laughs> um, and then we also have Inject, which is a whole category where we figured out how to break free of uh, the comm chains and uh, get to the Windows API. And from there we do reflective DLL and Mimicats and stuff. And, we have a cool demo. So stager architecture is uh, generally in a post exploitation setting, you're gonna hook by a manual command. That's what you do with PowerShell Empire. Uh, you just run a command and then it calls home. Um, you can hook from IE if someone, so you can fish somebody, and if they click yes, run this, you know, <laughs> all these ActiveX objects, it'll work. Uh, also office macros, you can do a stager that way. Um, so all we're using is a simple uh, HTTPS threaded server in Python as the uh, main C3 server. Uh, so you get encryption through TLS or SSL. There's a caveat there, a uh, couple caveats. So one is uh, older versions of Windows won't have TLS enabled, so you'll have to fall back to SSL. And the other one is you need a valid certificate, so you'll have to call home to a domain that you own a certificate for. And how we do the, uh, the call home is we do a long pull. So this is kind of the old way of doing Ajax, uh, before web sockets, is you call home to the server and then the server hangs you for like a long time until there's a job to be done. 
And it tells you that job and you run that job. So there's a couple problems with that. <laughs> Uh, there's no problem with uh, hanging forever because once you go into the uh, com object and you run that, you're in com world. It's outside of your script context. But there is uh, a limited amount of instructions you can run in JScript. So it's actually default to 5 million, I believe. So if you run 5 million instructions in JScript, which is actually very easy to do, uh, even for just a few milliseconds, it's going to pop up an error saying, stop running this script, and it's going to hang the script until the user clicks yes or no. So for that reason, we fork on a regular basis. So the first time you call home to the server, you're not going to have a session ID. Um, it's going to assign you a session ID, and it's going to fork to a special job called stage. That stage is going to do that long polling process I was talking about uh, until it gets the job ID. When it gets that job ID, it's going to fork uh, that special stage job again so we don't use too many instructions, and it's going to fork the job. And then uh, when that job calls home, it's going to have both the session ID and the job ID. So then it's going to send the job payload, which is going to do some work. It's going to report back to the server about that work, and then it's just going to strictly exit. Um, so some of the stages we have, uh, we do have the traditional way of running JScript and VBScript uh, through CScript or WScript. These require dropping a file on the disk, so um, antivirus can catch that pretty easily and you can always disable the Windows script host. Uh, an interesting stager that we have are MS, uh, HTA, HTML applications. So these are kind of like an, a weird IE security zone uh, that lets you get access to the registry, the file system, the command shell. Um, and the payload for that is really tiny. It's the tiniest uh, payload we have. All you do is run H or MS HTA and then a URL. And then it's going to call home without a session ID and get assigned one and all that. Um, so with these HTML applications, they're going to pop up like a little browser window. So we experimented with many techniques to try and hide this window. Uh, the best that I could come up with, and I really did a lot of experimentation, was I moved the uh, window 2,000 pixels off the screen, resize it to one pixel, and then I blur it so it doesn't steal focus. And then also there's some uh, XML that we can do to hide it from the taskbar. Uh, I thought this was really bad until I looked at some malware samples that were doing the same thing, so I, I didn't feel as bad. Um, so run DLL32, uh, this kind of abuses the way that run DLL32 uh, parses uh, the DLL it's supposed to run. So in this example, it's loading the mshtml.dll and it's running run HTML application on it, uh, which is the same thing that mshta does, only this is a little bit more hidden. Now, when that function gets called, it's going to parse the entire command line, and it's going to see it starts with JavaScript colon, and it's going to start uh, executing JavaScript. So actually, our MSHTA stager, as soon as we fork, uh, we go to this one because it has less window visibility. Um, another one that, uh, another stager here that uh, sub-T we discovered is uh, called com plus scriptlets. Uh, they still get written to disk, but it's, uh, this program called regserver32.exe, which is supposed to assist you in uh, installing uh, com stuff, uh, you can actually feed that a URL, and it's going to go fetch that scriptlet, and then it's going to run some J script. Um, so this is actually a stager that's present on Windows 2000. MSHTA is not. Uh, maybe it is in a service pack, but at the uh, beginning it's not. Um, so there's a couple ways to run commands. Uh, the most common way is through wscript.shell. It has two ways to run commands, either exec or run. Uh, exec gives you access to standard out and standard error uh, for all of uh, that process's output. Uh, the only problem is it's going to flash a little command.exe window. So it's not good. Uh, we had to resort to dot run, uh, which does not give access to standard out. Um, but we kind of pipe to a UUID in the temp folder, a text file, and we pipe uh, standard out and standard in to that file, and then we read that file. So we're able to get the output. Um, another way to uh, start processes is with WMI. Um, Win32 process is a part of that. And that's the Windows management instrumentation. It's just kind of for managing boxes. Um, so one of the main things you want to do with post exploitation tool is upload files and download them. Uh, but binary data is very hard to work with in JScript. Um, so writing, if you want to write a file to disk, writing byte by byte, uh, 
you use all of your limited instructions I was talking about. Um, so what we do, what, what, one way you can do that is you can write the response body stream directly to uh, an adodb.stream. Uh, the only problem is, as you can see, uh, you get an error that says safety settings on this computer prohibit access, accessing a data source on another domain. So this is part of that IE security zone sandboxing I was talking about. Um, so what we do is we create a temporary uh, ADODB object in memory. We write that stream to that object in memory, and then so now it's on our domain or whatever, and then we're able to write that to file. So this is just some boilerplate co code that just lets you write directly to file without using a lot of instructions. Another problem we encountered was with downloading files. So this is when you want to get a file. Um, it's on the zombie. You know, you see X-rays. You see something interesting on the uh, target, you want to download it to your machine. You're going to do that by having it send an HTTP request, sending an octet stream, which is going to have uh, all that binary data. The only problem is that Windows is going to uh, double encode that data. Uh, so through some reverse engineering, we figured out it was encoding it with Windows 12.5.2 encoding first, and then UTF-8. Uh, so we saw that the binary data did not match up when we got it back. Uh, another thing is if you send a null byte, it just ends the response stream right there, uh, the request stream. Uh, so we had another layer of encoding where we encode backslashes and null bytes. So we have three different decodings we have to do once it gets back to the server. It was really slow. Uh, LF not wrote a hard coded lookup table. So it's about one second per megabyte now, down from 10 seconds per megabyte. Um, so these are all of our UAC bypasses. These work um, because on Windows there's the current user hive, which a user is able to write to their current user hive, no problem. Um, and then Windows has these binaries in the system 32 folder that have a manifest that auto elevates them, gives them UAC bypass privileges. And then there's a couple binaries that are going to look in that current user hive that you're allowed to write to for a command to run. I don't, I don't know why. But <laughs> you, so we're just going to put the stager command at those registry keys start that process and it's going to call home and we're going to be elevated. Um, Microsoft is trying to fix some of these. They've closed a couple of them in Redstone 2 and 3, um, but there's UAC me by H Firefox. Uh, it's some future work if, you know, these methods get closed down. There's 35 plus methods we can use. Uh, some are applicable. So uh, another main thing you want to do in a post-exploitation tool is dump the NTLM hashes off the server. Uh, so there's a reg.exe I believe it was added in some service pack of Windows 2000. It's at least present in Windows XP and, and higher. Uh, but from there, if you're elevated, you can save the same system security hives and run uh, core security and packet, which will uh, decode, decrypt those hives and give you the hashes out of them. Same thing for domain controllers. Uh, you can create a volume shadow copy uh, and then the system hive, you can get that. And we get the ntds.dit. We can run the same tool. Uh, with some different arguments and extract uh, AD credentials out of them. So there's several different uh, HTTP COM objects. Uh, most of them are just like, like msxml2.xml HTTP and then there's a server XML HTTP. So this dates back to uh, the early days of the internet um, where you first started with AJAX. And so the ones that are not marked server are going to have a bad uh, sandboxing policy. It's going to have that cross-origin AJAX policy you see in web browsers. Whereas the server versions are going to be what you would have ran on a classic ASP server if you wanted the server to fetch something. So it's going to be less sandboxed. Um, so it's the same interface but a little bit different behavior. Um, using these objects, uh, checking out the error messages they do when we try to do an HTTP connect connection to a, uh, an IP. Uh, we're able to tell which ports are open. And so we have two different methods um, of telling if a port is open or not and uh, based on the error codes. So we were able to write a TCP scanner using these methods. Um, another interesting COM object is the uh, wscript.network. This lets you enumerate the printer connections and the network drives that that computer is connected to. So that's useful information. And now we're going to talk about uh, the, the pivoting modules. So PSExec uh, was originally written by Mark Rosinovich. Uh, 
first the sys internals before it was hired by Microsoft. Uh, now it is a Microsoft signed binary. And this lets uh, admins run commands on different uh, boxes remotely. Um, there's no reason for us to have to upload this binary to the server because Microsoft is hosting it on a live share on the internet. So we just use that live share. Um, we do get a dirty bit when we do that, but the bypass I found was just running it. Uh, instead of wscript.run, I ran it through WMI or something, I forget. But we didn't get that dirty bit, which would have popped up a message of an error. Um, so that, that just lets you run commands on another box, and we do have a working pivot with that. Another way to uh, pivot is with WMI. Uh, so this lets you spawn that WMI uh, Win32 process I was talking about on another server. Uh, as long as you have uh, cache or either your credentials or uh, you get credentials out of memory. You can't perform it past the hash uh, with JScript, we found. Um, a really bad problem with this is when you start that new process, it's going to run in session zero on the server, which is a GUI list process, so you won't be able to elevate. Um, but it, it does let you get onto other boxes, and maybe there's a workaround. Another thing that's been uh, making the, the, the waves the past couple uh, weeks are uh, DCOM lateral movement techniques. Uh, so MMC20.application Enigma X03, OX03 uh, found back in January, but it has a, you can spawn this object on another server and it has an interface called execute shell command. But let's see restage. Um, and then just this week we had Excel.application and Outlook.application by Ryan Hansen, 424F, 424F, and uh, Staldrad. Uh, but both of these have ways that you can uh, load uh, commands on another server. Um, so that's some future work. We don't actually have plugins for this yet. But if you know PS Exec and WMI aren't good enough, uh, we can write a plugin for DCOM. Um, so now we're going to talk about some of the ways we escaped that uh, COM context into Windows API. So uh, work, they gave us some office licenses. And we did find a good use for them. We, don't, we didn't actually write any reports with them, but uh, we did create a GUI list Excel object in memory. And then from that GUI list Excel object, we also wrote some registry keys that let us uh, uh, run macros without a prompt. And so we actually, uh, and when you run macros in that, it's Visual Basic, which is different than VB script. That lets you get access to uh, the, the entire Windows API. So from there, we were able to run shell code or reflective DLLs. So that's one of the ways we escaped. Uh, another technique uh, was published a couple of months ago by Tiranito. He's a guy from Google Project Zero. Um, so when you install .NET on a server, it gives you, or a workstation or anything, it gives you a bunch of COM objects uh, for that .NET installation. And, one of the, and a couple of those COM objects that you write to memory and then also deserialize a .NET object. And when you can deserialize a .NET object, you get access to the Windows API because .NET has access to Windows API. So uh, we can do all that from JScript. Um, and then the final way we found in our research was Dynamic Wrapper X. This was a DLL written by Yori Popov and released as freeware in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, it does have zero out of 61 of iris total. Uh, people are using this for legitimate reasons. Um, but basically this just lets you install a COM object on the server which gives you access to the Windows API. Um, normally installing a COM object, you're gonna have to write a lot of registry keys and stuff like that. Um, but sub T uh, rediscovered a thing called uh, registration free COM. So we don't actually have to write all those registry keys, we just drop a manifest file also on the disk and that DLL and then we're able to load that COM object, at least for our process. So now that we have access to the Windows API, one of our design goals was to use the powercats.dll. So this is the uh, PowerShell Empire DLL uh, that lets you get access to Mimicats. Uh, there was a problem with this, and that was that all of the DLL mapping was performed in PowerShell. So normally with a reflective DLL, you're going to write some C code uh, that will load itself. And uh, they did it in PowerShell. Uh, so we have limited instructions. We can't do all of that DLL mapping. So what I did is I wrote a DLL called Mimi Shim, and that's just a normal reflective DLL. So all the uh, loading code is in C. It's part of the DLL, and we just say start a thread there, and then it'll load itself. 
so what it's going to do is it's going to see if we're an x64 pro or an x86 process on an x64 system, which if you've ever uh, dealt with Mimicats, that can be an issue. If that is an issue, we're, uh, we're just going to fork uh, um, a sysnative notepad.exe. We're going to process all of that uh, and inject the powercats.dll into it. And from there, we're going to do a couple default things. We're going to do, we're going to get the debug privilege, which is kind of a god mode privilege on Windows. And then we're going to elevate our token to system. And then we're going to run whatever custom Mimicats command you want to run, uh, which will let you extract plain text passwords out of memory. Uh, provided that credential guard or some other defenses aren't enabled. And with that, I'll let Elif not uh, run the demos. I heard you guys like live demos. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to show our tool off. At least we have a screen. I heard we had screen problems on the other ones. So we'll close this off. Okay, uh, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're just going to load it up and we're trying to get our stager first, right? I know we were talking about this in the beginning. So, so we load up and we're greeted with a screen like this. Uh, we have a lot of options in here. So as you can see, it's a very similar kind of structure to like Metasploit or other tools of a similar kind of nature. Uh, we run info and we can set our L host. This is a, a local host internal network uh, for a domain that we have here uh, on a couple of VMs right now. Yeah, the only reason why he's setting his L host manually is because we have a weird network set up, so we're not on the internet. Uh, normally, it'll try to go to 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8 .8 and uh, get your IP, your local IP automatically and spawn a stager there. So, and then after that's run, uh, the stager is done, you can close the window and you see no windows popped up and nothing seems out of the ordinary, but we get a stager coming back right here. Uh, and we'll see, uh, if we take a good look here, uh, it's not an elevated prompt, uh, as you can tell right here. We would come back with a star if it was. Uh, and so from here, uh, we have our zombie uh, and we can kind of do what we want. Uh, so to demonstrate the kind of ridiculousness that we had to go through, uh, we can kind of upload a file, get a SHA sum, download the file, and do a SHA sum again. So we're going to use an implant, and we see everything has a, like a nice little options file. So we can also get into a, a command shell from here. Um, so if we look onto our hooked client right here and we take a look at the directory uh, where we should have uploaded uh, the putty, and you'll see it, uh, and it's right here, nice and uploaded. Uh, we'll open up a, a local window right here and we'll do a SHA sum of the actual putty file. We'll see, it says it's SHA sum right here, 8.1 and ends with 5e. And so now we will download the file from the victim client right now, the one that's hooked. Uh, oops. So we have our file right here. And we'll see uh, that the integrity has been kept, right? So we got a nice upload and download. Uh, and the client doesn't notice a thing, no windows are coming up, nothing at all. It's uh, nice and in the background here. So uh, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna try to elevate the prompt, right? A little bit of a UAC bypass and stuff like that, right? So we're gonna use, or uh, an elevation. So 
So if everything, if, if everything goes right, we should be see a, a shell come back with a little bit of an elevated type of thing. It looks like we're coming back. And here we are. We have a nice elevated prompt. All right, so uh, from here, uh, you could kind of uh, move around and try to pivot across the network. I know we were trying to explain to everybody the, the ridiculousness that it had to do for kind of TCP scanning and everything along that line. So what we could do is we could try to find another victim, and we could scan them, look for like an open port 445, and then try to migrate and pivot, right? Or pivot, just pivot this time. So uh, we're going to use another implant for this. It doesn't really matter what zombie we use for this. Response is a little ridiculous. We had to make it large for everybody. So, as we see here, a nice little readout of the nice scanning from one of the uh, hooked hosts to another host upon the domain. And right now, uh, we're going to try to pivot. Okay? So, uh, we're going to use. Uh, we are inject. Actually, uh, we should probably get the hashes first from the current machine that we got, right? We're going to use the uh, elevated zombie uh, with the elevated privileges to kind of dump the hashes here. And here we go. Uh, we got the hashes from the task that's machine. Hmm? Uh, and that's a Mimikatz command. Uh, you can kind of run any command from there uh, from Mimikatz. So uh, right now we're going to uh, kind of pivot from the one machine that's compromised, and we're going to pivot, and we're going to get a stager on the next machine uh, within the domain, right? We, uh, as you see, we got the credentials from Emicats, and so we're assuming we got a plain text password or something along that lines, and we're going to move on to the next machine. So. And here we go. Uh, we pivoted uh, throughout the network, and uh, we moved. And we can see a command shell. Uh, we take a look here. We take a look at who am I. And we're here on the machine, pivoting through the network, um, nice and through all these nice little com objects and everything here. So. Yeah, so you can see he has uh, two different, or three different shells here. The first one was his uh, medium integrity. Next one was when he elevated. And then this has a different IP because he's pivoted uh, to another machine. Where's it? At? Uh, 
Um, so we're going to talk about some of the mitigations you can do against this. Uh, there are some uh, ransomware samples that we saw that do all of their uh, operations in JScript, including their cryptography. Um, so people are mainly focused on PowerShell right now. We kind of wanted to point out that uh, JScript is also an attack surface. So there's a thing called the anti-malware scanning interface. I haven't actually played with it, but it was designed to catch PowerShell scripts before they execute. Uh, it's also a hook for antivirus to get uh, JScript and VBScript uh, files before they execute, even if they're uh, using the type of in-memory stagers that we talked about. Um, another thing is device guard, app locker, CI. It's all kind of a, the same umbrella uh, for a term, uh, a common term called app whitelisting. Um, in your environments, you only want to run the programs that you want to run, and this will actually prevent a lot of extra malware that gets on your system from running if you only have a whitelist of what can run. Um, it's kind of a pain to set up right now. It requires a lot of uh, PowerShell and registry editing. Uh, I've heard that there are good things coming there, so just keep an eye out, probably Redstone 4 uh, next year. Um, but if you do get it working, you want to block the Windows script host, you want to block HTA and uh, complex scriptlets. Um, you can also delete uh, the mshta.exe and reg server. Uh, some components rely on that, and Windows Update will probably reinstall them. Um, but that's one thing you can try. Another thing is you can delete com objects if you're not using them. It's hard to tell what you're actually using, uh, including the script parsers themselves, so like a JScript and VBScript. Those are all com objects that are script parsing. I haven't actually tried deleting them. I think you might brick your system. But <laughs> uh, we do have some uh, intent to add this to Metasploit, at least for a target as PS exec. Uh, so right now, um, it, has, uh, it drops a file or it runs a PowerShell command. We want to do a MSHTA command back and then iterate through all those methods that we found to fork to uh, Windows API and try to spawn a meterpreter binary that way. Uh, just iterate, yeah, just iterate all over those methods. Um, some more future uh, work is exploring COM, uh, seeing what is exposed through the interfaces. Uh, it's a large attack surface on Windows that was kind of forgotten about or it's kind of a difficult concept to, to grasp. Um, Terranito has a cool tool, I forget what it's called, like OLE viewer or something, uh, that lets you get the interfaces for a lot of these COM objects and you can see what you can do with them. Uh, another thing is that with this tool, like I said, there's a lot of bugs. Uh, so we do plan to clean up the code and uh, do a small plugin revamp. So uh, right now plugins are kind of reusing a lot of the same code. And uh, we also want to implement a JavaScript obfuscator. So right now all the payloads are pretty generic, they're all the same. Um, but if we had an obfuscator, it's going to kind of uh, add some uh, bypasses for very obvious lookups of that. Um, we've kind of neglected persistence implants. That's why we didn't talk about them. There are a few ways to get persistence. So that's when the machine reboots. It'll restage. Uh, WMI subscriptions is one that we could do. And then another thing is we're using the basic uh, Python server, uh, just very generic. Uh, so we actually do have the slow loris attack. I believe that works on this. So remember, we dropped that O'Day uh, uh, SMB Loris. That we have the slow Loris attack on this. Um, so that's one thing we want to close down by throttling the amount of IPs. Some related talks uh, by Tiranito. He did Com in 60 Seconds. This is the best primer on Com you can watch, uh, better than any book I ever read. Um, he does it. It's not actually 60 seconds. It's 60 minutes. But he did it at Infiltrate uh, this year. Another one is Windows Archaeology, which uh, Sub-T and Enigma OX3 did at B-Sides Nashville this year. And then last year, Sub-T wrote a very basic uh, JScript rat and presented that at DerbyCon. Uh, we kind of expanded that concept and made it uh, you know, as close to Empire as we could. And so yeah, this code is available at GitHub, uh, zero sum slash coedic. Uh, we're also doing a workshop today. Uh, it was uh, registration only, though. But we have also released that code as well. Uh, just check my GitHub. Uh, more uh, lower level stuff, C and shell code, but still cool stuff. So, yeah, yeah that's zero sum and Aleph not. Yeah. Thank you guys very Thank much. You.